Welcome back to week three of supersymmetry and conformal field theory. Uh, this week we're going to discuss chapter three in the class notes. I have in mind uh, three mini lectures for the week. The first lecture, this lecture is a very natural continuation of the last lecture of the previous week. So if you remember last time uh, we introduced uh, the conformal symmetry group and how it acts on space-time points. Now this time what I'd like to do is discuss how the conformal symmetry group acts on quantum fields. That will be the first lecture. It's a very central and important lecture to the rest of the course, and it really relies on what we did uh, last time, last week as well, in the last, last mini lecture. So if you were at all uncertain about what we did last time, it would probably be a good idea to review that lecture uh, before listening to this one. Uh, so after we do that, after we discuss the action of the, of the conformal symmetry group on quantum fields, uh, we're going to go on next time, uh, we're going to think about the stress tensor, which is a very special uh, operator uh, in, in quantum field theory, and what properties the stress tensor has in the context of conformal symmetry and conformal field theories. Now, the third lecture this week, we talk about correlation functions. Correlation functions are the bread and butter of quantum field theory. They, uh, they give you the correlations between different quantum fields. They are the observables of quantum field theory. Uh, and in that third lecture, we'll discuss the constraints that conformal symmetry puts on these correlation functions. Okay, so that's our plan for the week. So again, this, this time, this, this mini lecture, we're going to discuss uh, how the conformal symmetry group acts on quantum fields. Let's get started. So I want to ask the following question. How does conformal symmetry act on a quantum field? And to get there, the first question I'm actually going to discuss is not, not how it acts on fields, but how it acts on states. From your knowledge of quantum mechanics, uh, I'm assuming you're, you're more comfortable with uh, the notion of a state, like the states of a harmonic oscillator. And then building on that, uh, we'll, we'll back out how conformal symmetry must then also act on the fields that create and destroy those states. So just to, to, to recall, in relativistic QFT, relativistic quantum field theory, we characterize states by their eigenvalues with respect to momentum. In conformal symmetry, uh, the momentum generators, the generators of translation, are not as special. Uh, they fail to commute with dilatations, with special conformal transformations, and they play a, a slightly subsidiary, subsidiary role. In CFT, in conformal symmetry and conformal field theories which have conformal symmetry, uh, the dilatation operator replaces the special role of momentum in uh, standard quantum field theory. So let, let's see how this, this arises. Uh, we'll get there eventually. I want to take a slight detour now so that I can build on, on stuff that I, I think you're familiar with. I want to first discuss the harmonic oscillator, and then we'll get right back to uh, conformal symmetry and representations of the conformal symmetry algebra. So the harmonic oscillator from quantum mechanics, not the classical one. So if you had a good quantum mechanics course, uh, you discussed these raising and lowering operators. They're usually called A and A dagger. Uh, they they uh, fail to commute. When you commute them, you get the number one. And uh, there's also a Hamiltonian uh, in this business. I'm going to forget about the, the frequency of the harmonic oscillator. I'll just set omega equals the one, and then I'll be able to write the, the Hamiltonian in a, in a simple way as just A dagger A plus some shift. So again, I'm thinking about the case where the frequency of the harmonic oscillator is just one, and this E naught would then be the ground state energy of my system. So when I, if I have these, if I have this setup in the harmonic oscillator, let's just review some some additional uh, commutation relations that come out of this setup. So I, I'm run, run, I've run out of space here. Let's go on to the next page. So here's my my commutation relations and the the Hamiltonian again. If I if I have this setup, then I, I can see that if I take H and I commute it with A, what do I get? Well, I get a dagger a commutator a, which I can write out in gory detail as a dagger a a minus a a dagger a. And so if I if I uh, if I separate out just in my head at least, I see I have an a to the right here of these expressions, and I've got a new commutation relation of just a and a dagger to the left of my my purple dotted lines there. And so I can I can write this as minus the commutator of a a dagger times a, which is just minus a. Okay, and similarly, similarly, if I take the commutator of H and A dagger, I get almost the same sign, almost the same thing, but with a minus sign, I get plus A dagger uh, out at the end. So I was saying before, there's a ground state. This is the state which is annihilated by uh, 
the lowering operator A. So if I act on the ground state with the lowering operator, I just get zero. And then because of that, and because of the structure of the Hamiltonian, if I act with the Hamiltonian on the ground state, I just get E naught times the ground state. And then there are furthermore, there are excited states, uh, which I get by acting with the raising operators, N of them, say, on the ground state perhaps not very well normalized. I don't really care about normalization uh, for this. And now if I act with the Hamiltonian on this excited state, after some uh, commutation relations, I'll find that this new guy has eigenvalue E naught plus N. All right, so what I, I wanna do here is compare, is compare these two commutation relations. I wanna compare these two commutation relations with the relations I get in the conformal group. So this is what I have in the harmonic oscillator. And in, in conformal symmetry, in conformal symmetry, what do I have instead? I have D with P, this is I P mu, and I have D with K, this is minus I K mu. And so because of this, I wanna think of D here is like the Hamiltonian. P here, I wanna think about that as a raising operator, and K here, I wanna think about this as a lowering operator. And I can build representations of the conformal symmetry algebra analogously in the same analogous fashion that I did for, for the harmonic oscillator. I can, uh, more specifically, I can define, instead of a ground state, we'll call it a primary state. And this will be a state, I act on it with my Hamiltonian, which is now the dilatation operator, and I get some number, some particular eigenvalue for it, which I'll call delta times i, and I can act with the lowering operator, which is the special conformal generator, and I'll just get zero. And that's my definition of a primary state, and it's like the ground state of a harmonic oscillator. Now I should really, I have this, I have this i index, so I should really say something about that as well. Uh, there's also a Lorentz index, and so if I like if it's, if it's not just a scalar state, if it has some representation of the Lorentz algebra, I can go and uh, think about how, how, how Lorentz generators act on that as well. But this part of it is just like you saw with the Poincaré group. There's no difference here. There'll be some representation of the, of the Lorentz group under which this state transforms. Uh, and this is what we called, um, this is what we called this, uh, this matrix GJI uh, in the past. I think this was the the first lecture uh, last week when we reviewed the Poincaré group. So you can also associate a Lorentz index here, and it, it's just, just, like for, just like for Poincaré. All right, and I want to say one more thing. So this, this factor of i is funny. This is different from what happens with, with, uh, with the harmonic oscillator. With the harmonic oscillator, you get real eigenvalues. You know, the, the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator. Uh, it must have real eigenvalues. And here, for some reason, I'm telling you, you get pure imaginary ones. And th this is a funny feature of conformal symmetry. It happens because the group that we're talking about is not, um, it doesn't have definite signature. It's SOD comma two. And because you have this indefinite signature, uh, there's some difficulties defining a positive definite inner product. And the, the corresponding proof that you use, the standard proof you use to prove that Hermitian operators have, have real eigenvalues doesn't quite work here. So in fact, what happens here is you get pure imaginary eigenvalues. But okay, that's just the way it happens. It's pure imaginary. It's almost as good as, as, as real. We'll live with it. And uh, in fact, we will usually just talk about the eigenvalue of the dilatation operator as delta. And we'll forget that secretly there really is an I there. All right, so that's, that's a primary state. That's a primary state. And now we can think about excited states, right? And, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna appeal to your, your knowledge of the harmonic oscillator. We don't call them excited states in this language, we call them descendant states, but they're analogous to the excited states of the harmonic oscillator. So instead of acting with a dagger, now we act with some product of uh, the momenta, p mu i. They don't all have to point in the same direction. And what happens then is the eigenvalue will shift, just like it shifted for the harmonic oscillator. You went from the ground state to the ground state plus some integer. Here you'll shift from delta, this, uh, the scaling dimension, to delta plus uh, some integer n. Okay, so that states. That's uh, how we think about representations of uh, the conformal symmetry algebra and how we represent them uh, in terms of quantum states. Now, the thing about conformal field theory is it's 
it's usually not formulated in terms of states. It's much more natural to talk about operators. Uh, and so we've got to go there. We've got to discuss how the conformal symmetry acts on operators. But now that we understand how they act on states, it's actually a small step uh, to try and understand how they act on operators as well. So we'll define a conformal primary operator uh, to be one that creates the corresponding conformal uh, primary state. So I have my operator, phi i. I'm going to put it at the origin. I'm going to act on the vacuum, uh, my quantum field theory vacuum. And this is defined to be uh, my uh, primary state that I was just discussing on the previous few slides. So given how the algebra acts on the states, we can deduce how they must act on the, on the operators themselves. They must act through some kind of commutation relation. So we're going to have d acting on phi at the origin. This must be i delta phi i at the origin. We think about the Lorentz generators acting on this conformal primary. Then we get the corresponding representation acting on that index i or j. And then finally we have the special conformal ones which will commute with uh, this operator at the origin. Okay, so you just pass from the action, direct action of the operator on the state to some kind of adjoint action or commutator action of this uh, of these generators on the on the operators that create those states. Of course, the origin is a special choice, and it'd be nice to know how these generators act on a primary field at arbitrary position, or indeed how to generate that that uh, field at arbitrary position. But we can do that through through the translation generators, right? Through translation, because translation is a symmetry of the theory. The origin looks like any other point, and so. So what? So phi i at x is just phi i at the origin conjugated with uh, the translation group element. Okay, so we can translate from the origin to any arbitrary point in our space. And then from that we can also deduce how uh, dilatation acts on phi at a general point. So if I have d with phi i x, well I can rewrite that in terms of d with phi i at o conjugated by these, these translation uh, group elements. So I have d e to the i p dot x phi i at the origin e to the minus i p dot x and then minus e to the i p dot x phi i at the origin e to the minus i p dot x d. And then I'm going to shift my perspective here from thinking about how the translation acts on phi to how it acts on d. So what I want to do is I want to uh, basically multiply uh, both the left and right hand sides of this equation by one in, in a funny way. So I'll, I'll rewrite this as e to the i p dot x e to the minus i p dot x d e to the i p dot x phi i of zero minus phi i at zero e to the minus i p dot x d e to the i p dot x e to the minus i p dot x. And we'll just define that to be the translated version, e to the i p dot x of the commutator of something, let's call it d hat, this is the translated version of the dilatation, phi at the origin, and then the final element of that translation acting on the operator. Right, I mean, it, there's just some mnemonic here, right? You, you always have to act with the e to the minus i p dot x on the right hand side, because you have in mind that you're eventually going to act again uh, with something else on the state. And so when you act on the state, that factor of e to the minus i p dot x has to cancel with the corresponding uh, thing you're acting with on the state, which is how you would translate the state uh, to the state at some other location. Okay, so at any rate, so that, that's what I have, right? And this, this d hat, well, this d hat is defined as e to the minus i p dot x, d e to the i p dot x. And now we should think about what that, what that actually is. It turns out we can simplify this expression using the, the conformal symmetry algebra. So if I write these exponentials out on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, let's just go to quadratic order here. They're higher order terms, but we'll see in a minute that they don't matter. Okay, and so what do I have here? I've got d as the leading order term, minus i x mu p mu d as the first order term. And then a little more work, you can see the quadratic term. I can write it as a double commutator of p mu p nu of d uh, plus higher order terms. Okay, so if you remember, if you remember this commutator in here, 
well, from the first part of the lecture, right? This is just the, what's, it's the, the, the low, sorry, the raising operator, except it's in the wrong order. So it's going to come with an extra sign here. It's going to be minus I P mu. But then if I were to plug that in over here and try and commute P with P, this would just be zero. And indeed that term and all the higher terms vanish by the conformal symmetry algebra. There's nothing else except the first two terms here. And so I can write this whole thing, this d hat, it's nothing but d minus x dot p. That's all that survives. So it is indeed a, lo a lot simpler than you, than you might have guessed. So d hat is d minus x dot p. Okay, so th then from this uh, we can figure out what the uh, what the full commutation relation is, right? We've got to plug this guy back up here and then conjugate with the momenta and see what we get. So let's do that on the next page. So I've written out uh, what, we, what we figured out on the previous page. I'm going to now plug my formula for d hat up into the line above. So when I act with the unhatted d on phi i, I just get a factor of this uh, scaling weight delta. And when I act with x dot p on the line above, I'll get a derivative acting on phi. And so what do you get? You get e to the i p dot x, there's an overall factor of i, delta plus x mu d mu, all acting on phi i of zero, e to the minus i p dot x. And now I can act with translation on the phi i and get phi i at x, because everything else here is not going to be affected. P mu doesn't act on those. It just, it's just designed to act on the field, right? So what I'm going to find, the others are just C numbers. So what I'm going to find, right, is I'm going to find I delta plus X mu D mu phi I at X, okay? So that's one thing you can work out. Now I'll leave something else as an exercise. You could, for example, you could work out how uh, the special conformal transformations uh, commute with phi i at an arbitrary point. So we know it at zero, this is just going to vanish. But what is it uh, when x is not zero? Now, I wanted to make a comment about a, a point of notation here. So I'm writing these commutators, uh, d with phi i of x. And earlier, we had a slightly different notation. We wrote, um, we wrote delta phi. Now, these are, these are closely related. Delta phi i is i lambda d phi i at x. OK, so the, the commutator. Um, it's just like how we discussed for the Poincaré group a couple of lectures ago. The commutator gives you part of the infinitesimal change of the field, and then you dress it up by a factor of i and lambda, and you get the, fu the full action. And so we, we could write this out in detail, and this is minus lambda delta x mu partial mu phi i at x. Okay, so this commutator, it's, it's telling you the infinitesimal change of the field in response to, well, in this case, dilatations. But if you work out the exercise, you'll also get the special conformal transformation rule as well. All right, let's keep going. So we have the infinitesimal uh, version, but we, we'd like to find the finite version. So I'm not going to do that directly. Instead, we'll, we'll work backward. I'll give you the finite version and we'll compute from it the infinitesimal one and check that it's correct. So the infinitesimal transformation integrates up to the following rule. That the transformed field at the transform location is this omega factor for the conformal transformation to the delta over two power. So delta is this weight uh, with respect to dilatation, the scaling weight of phi at x. And I'm only giving it to you at the moment for scalar fields. I'll give you the more general uh, result at the end, although we won't, we won't check it. We'll just check this, this scalar result. So let's check. So for a scaling transformation for dilatation, sorry, I'm, I'm just gonna check it for dilatations. It's in fact the same result uh, for special conformal as well, um, which I'll, 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 I'll leave as an exercise. Okay, so let's check it for dilatation. So we have x prime equals one plus lambda of x. And if we want it to be infinitesimal, we want to take lambda really small. And we saw uh, last week that the omega factor for such a dilatation would be one plus lambda to the minus two power. So this is last week. All right, so we have phi prime of x prime is going to be then one plus lambda to the minus delta phi of x, where I've used now the finite transformation rule. And now I want to expand this out to linear order in lambda, and what do I get? I get um, phi of x minus delta lambda phi of x. Now there's a, there's a really kind of confusing point, or at least I always find it confusing, that when we talk about delta phi, uh, we want to compare the field at the same point. So we're not comparing phi prime at x prime with phi of x, we're comparing phi prime at x with phi of x. 
So this is not a typo that I have phi prime of x prime up here, both the field and the point get transformed. Whereas down here in the delta, I only have phi prime and x is at the same point. When I, when I look at the change in the field, I want to compare it at the same point. Now x is just a label here. I could equally well compute delta phi at some other point. For example, we could do it at x prime instead, and that's what we're going to do. It just has to be the same point, okay? And so we know what? We know already that um, we know how to write this guy. So to compute this now, I need to expand the second term in the Taylor series, right? From the previous uh, slide, this first term is just approximately phi of x minus uh, delta lambda phi of x. But this one, we don't know yet. So let, let's expand that out. So we can write phi of x prime at, at linear order and lambda as phi of x plus lambda x mu partial mu phi of x. And now finally, delta phi at x prime, I can write that as minus delta lambda phi of x minus lambda x mu partial mu phi of x. This is almost what I want. And now I claim as a last step, uh, I can convert x to x prime on the right hand side because I'm already at linear order in lambda. And so I can write this as approximately minus, and then what do I have? Minus lambda delta plus x mu partial mu a phi at x prime. And that, I believe, is what we set out to prove, right? This was, this was the infinitesimal uh, rule that we worked out from the commutation relation. So indeed, uh, this finite transformation rule for dilatations at least seems to be correct. And I should leave it as an exercise then to check this also for KMU, for the special conformal transformations. That's a slightly more involved exercise, uh, but it works in a similar fashion. All right. I have one final remark uh, before I end uh, this mini lecture. I promised you the transformation rule for a general uh, tensorial field. So let me write that down. It's a bit of a mess. We'll put it on the next slide. So let's imagine I have some field, very complicated. It's got a bunch of tangent indices and a whole bunch of cotangent indices. Uh, I won't even talk about spinner fields, although in principle one can do that as well. So this is just uh, ve vector indices, vector type indices. Now the rule, I again have this factor of delta over two, but then I, I'm going to correct it uh, by the spins, by how many of these extra indices there are. So it's not quite the same. And the reason it's not quite the same is that because of all those indices, I've also got to, I've got to use the, uh, the chain rule, right? So, so I've got a, a bunch of factors of dx prime nu one, dx beta one, to convert nu prime indices into beta unprimed indices. I have to go on to the next line here. I told you it was a bit of a mess. I'm going to have dx mu one, dx prime alpha one, all the way up to dx mu m, dx prime alpha m, and then finally beta one up to beta n, alpha one up to alpha m. So we won't use this uh, for anything that has more than one or two indices, uh, but there is the rule in general. And again, you have this slight shift from the scalar rule, so you don't need quite as many, or sometimes you need more powers of this omega, depending on how many of these extra Jacobian type factors uh, you require to, to convert the indices uh, from one frame, from say the prime frame to the unprime frame. All right, that's all I wanted to say in this first mini lecture. So again, we discussed how the conformal symmetry acts on uh, quantum fields and quantum states. Uh, we discussed the definition of a primary state and a descendant state, a primary field and a descendant field. Uh, and we discussed these, these relations both from an infinitesimal point of view and also the finite one. And at least in the simple case of dilatations, we showed how uh, the infinitesimal rule follows from the finite transformation rule. Great. That's all I want to say. Tune in next time and we'll, we'll talk more about a very special kind of operator in conformal field theories, the stress tensor.